All right, DJ Lubis. And DJ Neko. Here with the Metal Tavern Radio Podcast with special guest Harold from the band Diggeth. How are you, sir? Thank you for joining us and taking the time out to talk to us. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, much love from a, a very hot Holland right now. Really? You know, it's actually kind of cool here. It's oh, all right. We, we hit uh, something like uh, 87 Fahrenheit. Which oh, is 31 nice. degrees Celsius over here. So for uh, for our country, that's 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 quite hot. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple of friends from out that way that we met through the line a few years ago, and they come out to visit occasionally for festivals. And uh, yeah, we I, I want to visit the Netherlands at some point because I, I hear it's lovely as hell. I haven't been back since 2001, but I I love the Netherlands. Like I I think it's the best country ever. So don't tell me you. <laughs> Well, I beg to differ, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I got a different perspective on uh, this. I loved. I mean, it was right when the tulips were blooming, and it was it was just beautiful. And we were. Uh, I really loved Delft. I I, wow. I absolutely love Delft. Yeah, um, it's a great city. Yeah, that's cool when you when you uh, call out a city like that because everybody's always referring to Amsterdam, but. You know, Netherlands is much more than, than just Amsterdam, you know, especially a city like Delft is, is great. Yeah. I stayed in I stayed in Amsterdam, but we um we had rail passes, so we went and checked out uh, we were in Harlem. Um All right. yeah. uh, we one went two. to to the Hague and I'm trying to think with this really cool old windmill. I think it was called the Eagle. It was very, very old uh windmill that we visited. Well, we got plenty of windmills going on. I so know. <laughs> Actually, actually, we played last week in Harlem uh, as support act to Mammoth. You know, uh, Wolfgang Van Halen's Mammoth. Oh, oh wow. yeah, yeah. Harlem is a great city. Yeah. Did you get a chance to talk to uh, Wolfgang? Very, very briefly, very briefly, but we did. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Nice what, uh, what style of music is he playing? Is it just like regular rock or? Um, it's a little bit um, American rock oriented, I would say. A uh, little commercial touch to it, very, very, you know, listenable songs, but executed really well. It really bunch, you know, great bunch of musicians. Yeah, sounded really well. So when it comes to the guest music, um, what kind of influences do you bring into the band? Like, what are your inspirations there with that? Wow, that's a good question to start off. <laughs> um, that's a lot. You know, I grew up with my older brother. And, you know, he played, when I was young, he played stuff like the Steve Miller Band and, you know, bands like Supertramp and Electric Like Orchestra, you know. Yeah, uh, ELO. That's ELO. So that's the stuff that, you know, that's, you know, like, like, like embedded, you know, in my brain. And when I got older, you know, um, I grew up with the first couple of Iron Maiden albums, you know, and then the heavier music came in, like, you know, the Motorhead stuff and, and the first Metallica stuff. So it's somewhere in between that, you know, I don't know, um, you know, classic 70s rock and the hard rock from the early 80s, you know, the new wave, new wave of British heavy metal and a lot of, you know, the early trash stuff, you know, when I was, you know, 13, 14, you know, I listened to bands like Exodus and the early Slayer and stuff like that and all that <laughs> mixed up somehow. But I've, I've, you know, I've got a broad taste. I, I bring in all kinds of stuff, you know. And uh, well, when you listen to our music, you hear all kinds of influences. I would say. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm probably around your age too. Like I grew up in the '70s, so uh, Blue Oyster Cult, yeah, Triumph, stuff like that. So I, I'm pretty familiar with all that. And then of course, right. it gradually got heavier and heavier yeah. as time went on. So yeah, I can relate to that for sure. Uh, I do know I was uh, kind of researching and I was listening to some interviews you've done. Um, you're a big fan of the first two Down albums. Um, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. The first couple of Down albums, you know, like they they had this thing going on, you know, this Sabbath kind of thing. But they put this sauce over it, you know, that made it really fresh and, and, and modern again. And the first Down album is a classic to my ears, you know. Yeah, and, and when I heard that, I, when I heard that album, you know, that was, I guess, somewhere late '90s. I guess I don't know when it came out, '95 or '96. I'm not sure. And I was playing in a band which was more, more of a trash metal kind of thing, more in the, in 
in the vein of Annihilator, you know, really fast guitar oh, wow. like that. I was really into that. And all of a sudden I heard down, you know, a completely in a different universe, you know, using more simple song structures, but having the riff, you know, having that that power. And I was really like, wow, you know, and that definitely changed my my view or better said brought me a little bit back to the stuff where I'm coming from, you know, like Tony Iommi and, and stuff like that, you know, having that one riff that carries the whole song, you know, that changed my perspective on songwriting, I guess. Yeah, I was curious because um, obviously recently Phil has like this controversy kind of hanging around him. Does that ever... He always has a controversy. Yeah, right. <laughs> but does that ever like change your view or how you approach music that you like or listen to? Or do you just kind of say, I can separate the artist from the art? I think that the latter. I mean, it's 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 difficult. I mean, I don't know if you um, follow the news in Europe for the last week or so. You know, like like Rammstein, you know, they're in, yes, in yes, uh, yes. this huge thing going on with the singer of Rammstein, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, there's this this cancel culture thing going on, you know, all of a sudden, if they, you know, misbehave or do something that doesn't fit the picture, then, you know, we have to eliminate the whole art, you know, and I think that's stupid, Same. you know, because um, there's, there's more to it, you know, I mean, the art is, is like a... a um, a sum up, you know, of, of a couple of people coming together, creating something, you know, and um, if somebody misbehaves or, or you know, uh, developed a strange attitude over the years, you know, we don't know. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You know, people right. can look pretty nice and maybe, you know, behind the scenes, they're, they're strange people, you know. But um, if you're going to look at that, you know, then... What happens if we find out that Rembrandt, you know, the, one of the biggest, great, greatest painters of the Holland, of the Netherlands, you know, was was an idiot, you know? <laughs> if what are we gonna do? And and you know, ban all his pictures and say, oh no, we're not gonna watch any Rembrandt pictures anymore because he was, right. complete, you know? Yeah, she uh, she brought up one time about H.P. Lovecraft and like some of his controversy with himself, and I'm like. Yeah. You don't hear people talking about it. There's a lot of people that love Lovecraft. It's like, yeah. but I mean, I mean, I mean, there's like, nothing wrong with 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 you know uh, condemning people's attitude or behavior, you know, or be be uh, uh, critical about that. But you know, condemning art, that's where it's getting dangerous. You know, the next step is burning books, and the next step yeah. is burning people. You know, so yeah. yeah. And and the thing with Rammstein right now is, I don't think he was actually convicted yet. There's nope. just been accusations. And they're not giving now. Granted, I do not condone sexual abuse. Please don't. It's that's not what it is. It's just accusations, and he hasn't had a chance to say his side of the story either. Exactly. Or, I mean, it's 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 a trial by media. You know. I mean, we haven't been there. We haven't witnessed it. Um, it's what people say. And and when did it happen? You know, it's it's terrible for the people. You know. And but. Um, I can judge it and I don't want to judge it. You know, I leave that to the people that, you know, have to do that, you know, and I listen to the music, I watch art, I read books. And, you know, if I have to look, you know, at every author, at every musician, you know, what they might have done or not have done, you know, it's it's getting pretty complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, we've gone from you're innocent until proven guilty to this whole like, oh, you're already guilty of whatever it is people say. And it's, yeah. it's so sad to see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I read also that um, the band dig it. Your your name. You, I guess you kind of took it somewhere from like the Bible in some ways. Exactly. <laughs> it's the it's the King James uh, translation in 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 the Bible where they uh, they use the different you know uh, way of, of of the verbs you know like to dig up, uh, run up you know and and. Uh, I read a part of that Bible, you know, where they, who shall dig a pit? And I went like, oh, that sounds heavy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so, so, you know, that sounded really, really cool. I went like, okay, that's, that's something. But the funny part is that many English speaking, speaking persons, you know, they ask me, you know, what, what's that band name about, you know? <laughs> so I have to explain that, which is pretty funny, actually. <laughs> no, it's cool because I was sitting there as I'm like reading all this and listening, and I'm like, you know, a good tagline would be like, "Diggeth and thou shall receive it." Yeah. <laughs> they love it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um. So, how did you all like become a thing? Like the formation was it always a three piece, or uh, did you have other members at one point? 
No, it was always a three-piece band. You know, it's what I told you before. You know, I used to play in more trash-like like bands, you know, which was always four-piece or five-piece bands. And uh, when I started this band, you know, early 2000s, you know, I was convinced of keeping it simple. You know, I was listening, you know, to stuff like Down, early Black Sabbath. And I went like, okay, you know, let's do something out of my comfort zone, you know, not have the two guitars. Because I grew up on Finn Lizzy, Iron Maiden, all that stuff with the dual harmony guitars. I, lo I love that stuff, you know. But I went like, okay, I want to go back to more a basic thing, having a really great riff, you know, uh, construct the whole song around that one riff, you know. And I was also convinced, you know, okay, let's have a shot at lead vocals. Let's see how far I can get with playing and singing at the same time. Let's see if my left part and right part of the brain uh, are capable of doing right. that. I always sang, you know, how many vocals in, in the other band? So, and I was like, okay, let's, let's try it, you know, because I was a bit fed up, you know, with having four-piece bands, five-piece bands, always have the discussion going on, you know, which musical direction, where are we going, all the business kind of decision stuff you have to do while playing in a band. And, um, you know, I looked at early bands, you know, like Cream, Jimi Hendrix Experience, CZ Top, for instance. Yeah, great but band, great band. Also, on the other hand, if you look uh, at a more recent band, a band like Pantera, basically they were a three-piece band. Well, they had a vocalist, but, you know, they had one guitar, drums, bass, you know. And I mean, let's let's see how far we can push that, you know. And the, the funny thing, or the great thing about a three-piece band is that you have a song, but when you play it live, you can do all kinds of stuff with it. You know, you can go into an adventure because you're with three guys, you know, or in our case, two guys and one girl, and um, you can do all kinds of stuff with the music. You know, it's, it's a, a kind of a jamming thing, you know that. All the early 70s bands had that thing, you know, when you went to see them live or nowadays when you look them up on, on YouTube, you see their adventures, you know, they have the, the, the studio version, but they have the live version where they take it to places, you know, and change stuff around. And that was the big thing for me. Like I said, OK, let's let's see if we can do that in modern day and age. Yeah, I think uh, Rush is notorious for doing that live. Yeah, you know? yeah. They just expand Definitely. on everything they've already done on the studio record. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, with your latest record, uh, Zero Hour in Doomtown, um, was this this was written during the pandemic era a little bit? So, is exactly. everything like kind of influenced on the record from that? Not so much, not so much. I mean, um, a lot of things happened uh, in between the previous album, Gringos Galacticos, which was our first USA release. And, you know, then we planned to do a couple of gigs in the United States in uh, 2020. And then the whole pandemic thing came and everything fell, you know, flat on its bottom. But um, in 2018, um, um, I lost my older brother who died oh, wow. of an illness, you know, the, the one actually who taught me about music, you know, and, and led me all the way with ELO and Steve Miller band and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I think that whole album, you know, a, a lot of the lyrical themes, you know, about, um, it's about, you know, letting go, you know, and the whole process you go through when, when you lose somebody or you have to make, big changes in your life, you know? And I figured, you know, like um, I saw an, I saw a movie from the um, British army from 1946, I think it is. It's actually called Zero Hour in Doomtown. And it's about the, about, about the um, atomic bomb tests in the, in, in the USA desert, you know? And you got this British broadcast voice, you know, telling about, you know, about the dummies being used for the nuclear blast, you know? And okay. you see all those tiny houses that they use for the, for the nuclear bomb. And I, I thought about it and I said, like, zero hour in doom town. Well, basically all our life, you know, we're all the time we're living in doom town, but we don't know when it's zero hour, you know? Oh, and yeah. you don't have to think about that too much, you know? But it's it's more about all the songs are a bit about my, about how do you live your life you know um how do you look at things you know do you worry too much or do you live in the moment or or did you take care of stuff enough you know all those questions that come to mind you know when you come to this 
moment in your life when you have to say goodbye to a loved one, you know, and all of a sudden all of it makes sense, you know, and maybe you overthink it or, you know, and this whole balance that you have in life, you know, like, like, uh, you know, giving, taking care of people, but also enjoying life. The whole album is about that balance. You know? That's a good perspective. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, it, it's zero hour to doom town. <laughs> no, I mean, that makes but sense. I, I mean... really try to live like that too. I don't want to ever, I want to be obviously kind and good to people, but you never know what's going to happen. And exactly. I, I try not to shy away from adventures or trying things just out of fear because in the end it's either going to work or it's not going to work, but you need to be a along for the ride and you need right. to see if you like it. Yeah. Yeah. And the funny part is, you know, when people read the lyrics, you know, they, always you know make their own thing of it you know maybe not even what i <clears throat> maybe intended with it you know but that's the cool part you know that's what happened to me uh when i listened to uh, music from other bands and read the lyrics you know and you know had my own ideas oh the song is about this or that you know and it had its own meaning and yeah. later on you read an interview <laughs> with the writer and they meant something completely different but yeah. that's 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 the beauty of it isn't it yeah yeah so I added a couple of clips, uh, quick clips for cool. some of your music in here. Um, the first one I've got for the people is it's a 25 second clip of uh, Soul Twister. So I know you have a video for that. Yep. So what is that song about a little bit? So see if people know. Um, that song is a little bit about, uh, I would say, uh, manipulation. You know, that, that, that you know, we, in, in recent years, we saw so much things going on within the media. You know, the thing what we talked about earlier, you know, with the singer from, from Rammstein, you know, we get, you look at in the newspaper, you look at the news and you get this truth presented, you know, and, and you have to stay really awake and focused, you know, and, you know, look at many sources, you know, to judge what is going on, you know, yeah. and, and it's, it's really difficult, you know, to, you know, stay on your on your lane, you know, and look at all this stuff going on without being sucked into a direction, you know. And that's what the song is about. You know, it's, it's one big soul twister where we're in, you know, and you have to make sure that you're in the eye of the storm somehow, you know, and, and keep your ground and don't get carried away with that side or that side. And and that's difficult. That's yeah. really difficult. Yeah, you know, the age of we, technology and social media, man, it's gotten worse. I mean... There's pros yeah. and cons of social media, obviously, but then there's a you know there's a lot of like bad things about it too. Yeah. And that's that's yeah. one of them. It, 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 and it's very difficult to make a decision nowadays, you know, based on the information you get, you know, because you maybe make a complete wrong decision because the information that's handed to you is not right, you know. So that's very difficult to. You have to be very aware of, um, you know. I I always find it really hard to have a a. You know, I talk to people and say like, oh, it's like this or it's like that, you know, and I go like, well, I don't know. You know, it's pretty difficult nowadays to judge things really properly, you know, and, right. and you have to be really careful with that. And that makes life difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just got to stay grounded, as you said, you know, I just got to look at everything. Well, and you know, the, the thing is, and, and that's a shame, you know, it, it divides us so much, you know, because we're on that side of the spectrum or on that side, you know, and there's nothing in between, you know. And and I think the good thing about music, you know, is that's the thing that connects us, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I have friends of mine which have completely different worldly views than I have, you know, but we get along really well because we like the same kind of music. Yeah. And that's how it's supposed to be, you know. It's 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 the diversion. That's what that I all think. Yeah, I'm, I'm all about you know individuality, yeah. and so personally, you can have whatever philosophy or ideology you want, but you know, there's still got to be some sort of connection there. Right. Right. All right. Well, here's a little taste of Soul Twister. All right. That's some good stuff that there. That is great. 
Yeah, I was checking out that record. I really, really liked it. Very cool. A lot of different grooves, a lot of different influence brought in. Like you said, I, I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, I noticed, though, with the first three releases that you had, that there was like this kind of like five-year gap between the full lengths. Then on the last couple, it's been a little bit more like three years. Is there any particular reason for that? Or is it just you like to take your time writing the album or um no i mean when we started you know we were quite for a long time we were an underground band you know playing pubs and playing small festivals and small clubs and you know and we put all our money and time together you know to get a first record out and you know later on i figured out you know if i want to do the records the way i envision them you know sound wise and the way they look you know i have to do things differently so i invested in uh, building my own studio you know and get that all perfected and that was done you know like somewhere i guess around 2000 well maybe about 10 years ago something like that and then i had the you know the options you know to record myself mix myself work on the songs the way you know i thought that the records you know, should sound. And, um, you know, the, the record before uh, Gringos Galacticos, that was Kings of the Underworld, uh, that brought us some attention in, in Holland and Belgium. And then we signed a record deal with the previous album and then an American deal came. And from, from there, you know, things started to move and it was, you know, a lot easier to, you know, plan stuff. Okay, we got to do the next album and then so forth, you know. So you get in that cycle, you know, of playing shows, Getting back to the studio, write another album. So things got a little bit easier since we made that decision. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, when it came to the new record, um, because, you know, obviously as a band, you're growing and you're, you're hearing other types of music, you know, just over time, you discover new sounds. Uh, when it comes to collaborating between you and the others in the band, uh, it, it, is it a, like a group collaboration with the music writing and style or... Yeah, Does definitely. Kind definitely. of handle the duties, or yeah, I mean, I mean, most of the of the riff ideas, it always starts with a riff, you know, you know, you know, comes from me, you know. I, I record music every day, you know. Every time when I pick up a guitar, you know, and I always look like, where's my cell phone? You know, I've got this idea, <laughs> I have to record it because if I don't, it's gone, you know. Yeah, I can yeah. remember the notes the next day, but I don't know exactly what I did, you know. What you feel? <laughs> so I got, you know, I got hundreds of these small <laughs> bits of videos you know stored on my computer you know going back years you know sometimes i click on you know something like from 10 years ago like hmm, that wasn't bad i didn't use that did i you know <laughs> and, and then I, I throw it at the band you know i start playing it doing sound check or i do it during rehearsal you know and then the other two guys you know they kick in and all of a sudden our drummer goes like hey that's nice, but if you eliminate that third note, I could do that, and that makes a complete mood swing. And I go like, you know, what are you doing to my guitar riff? And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, oh, now I'm hearing what you are hearing, you know. Yeah. And then our, our bass player goes like, uh, excuse me, um, that what you do on the bass drum? Could you do that? Repeat that because the bass goes that way, and then it shifts another way. And we're all like, oh wow, you know, and. As soon as I can put a vocal line over it and it sticks, you know, that that's always the measurement. You know, if I'm the next day on my bicycle and I can whistle the melody that we did the day before, then I know we're on the right track for a song. <laughs> it works like that. Yeah, that's actually kind of cool. That is really yeah. cool. Yeah. And that's, that's the fun part, you know, because and, and that's, you know, what I... Uh, it's it's like painting together, you know. You have this idea, you have this rough sketch, and somebody goes like, "Oh, but you could also do that or this," and you're like, "Okay, you know." And maybe you know, sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, and then we forget about it, or it. And most of the times, you know, when it when it sticks, you know, and somebody goes like, "Hey, that thing that we had last week," you know, I had it in my in my head all the week. I go like, "Ah, now we're on something onto mm -hmm. something." It's stuck, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's stuck. Yeah. Uh, so when you're all like finally putting everything together, are you doing it all together in a studio or do you kind of do it remotely and send it to each other or? No, we, we, we do it all together. We make uh, we make pretty, you know, definite demos, you know, where we go like, OK, this is what the song is supposed to be. 
And uh, most of the times we record, you know, the basic tracks, so let's say the first rhythm guitar and the, and the bass and the drums, we record it live, you know, because I think that's a lot of the beauty of, you know, the early 70s, 80s records. You know, why do they, you know, sound the way they do? Because you hear a band playing, you know. And nowadays with all the modern uh, recording technologies, I mean, we also use them, you know, otherwise you, you couldn't have a studio of your own. That would be impossible. If you would have tried that, you know, let's say uh, 30 years ago, it would have been impossible. Right. But nowadays, you know, you have this te technology, but what, what happens a lot is, you know, that people ram stuff into the computer, you know, and they start twe tweaking it around and making it perfect, you know, and everything is in time and every guitar lick is in time and the vocals are tweaked. And that's not my idea about, about making music, you know, it, it has to be, it has to be human. It, it, it has to have this pulse to it, you know, there has to be little flaws, you know, little imperfections. If you listen to old uh, records, they all have these little imperfections, you know, but that's the stuff that we we like, you know. Yeah, and uh, also when it comes organic. to music. Yeah, organic. It has to have organic, a yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. And, and nowadays with modern mastering, you know, uh, luckily there is this, I think there's this huge turning point, uh, point nowadays because people are are, are getting fed up with this modern production where everything sounds like bang, like that. You know, the first 10, 20 seconds, you're blown away with a modern production. We're like, whoa, you know, but it's also very um, harsh on the ears, you know. it's There's no letting go. It's like bang, like that, yeah. you know. And music has to do this, you know. That's the whole point. Ebb and flow, ebb and flow. Exactly, exactly. Uh, are you all touring right now? I'm sorry? Are you touring? Yes, we are. Actually, we uh, what I said. We uh, last week we uh, we played Harlem uh, together with Mammoth, and we got a couple of shows uh, coming on with with Legion of Doom, former known as the Skull. Uh, they're coming over uh, to Europe next week, so we're doing a couple of shows with them in in Germany, Holland, and Belgium. And we got a couple of summer festivals going on, and the real thing starts for us uh, early October. Then we're coming over to uh, to the United States for a couple of shows that we plan to do in 2020, but we're now going to catch up with that. So that will uh, will be the Chicago, Milwaukee area, and then the rest of October, November, December, we will be full on touring uh, in Europe. Okay. Yeah, we were pretty much booked until uh, the end of December. That's a, that's amazing. So that's when, when it that's comes great. to like uh, setting up tours in the U.S., I mean, how does that work for you? Because like I would love to see you guys live, but we're in Baltimore, Maryland, so I don't know how accessible that would be like how does that work for you well you know touring the united states uh, comes pretty close to landing on the moon <laughs> uh, especially for, for a european band right uh, i'm not sure if touring in china is easier than touring in the united states but uh, we we'll have to look into that but it's it's it's, it's difficult uh, the good thing is you know i mean we're a small band you know and we're really happy with having Kumran Records in the United States. They did an amazing job for us, you know, especially in the Chicago, Milwaukee area, you know, with a lot of dedicated people, you know, putting a lot of heart of soul in the, in the promotion and, you know, really people demanding us, you know, come over and play shows over here, you know. So that's really cool, you know, but getting all the stuff done, visa and all that stuff, that takes a lot of preparation, a lot of preparation. Yeah, yeah I bet. So as far so far in your career as touring and everything, do you have any like memorable shows or great times that you can remember having? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, I remember some years ago uh, we were really lucky to uh, to support Slayer and Megadeth when they were touring together. That that was that was amazing. You know, you know amazing, big, big 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 arenas, you know, and that was really cool. But also, what, what was really memorable, we did a, a tour with Michael Schenker. Ah. And, and Michael Schenker is, is an amazing guitarist. And uh, he was a really lovely guy. You know, there were a lot of stories about him, you know, what Michael Schenker would be like. And it turned out he was one of the nicest guys, you know. So and it was really, yeah, really a, a, a cool thing to be on the road with, with Michael Schenker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fan of his as well, so yeah, yeah it was amazing. And his brother too, because I used to kind of grow up liking the Scorpions a bit. So 
definitely yeah so yeah that that was 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 really cool you know uh, but also i mean it it's it's a you know i always you know look a little bit ahead you know what i'm doing today and hopefully we'll be doing tomorrow you know last week we played with mammoth you know you go like wow you know here's wolfgang van halen you know son of the, of the great late eddie van halen you know and and what an honor to play with this guy you know and yeah that's how we look at it you know every day um we're happy doing this you know and we have some great shows coming and well you know seize the day there you go and I was kind of looking at some of your live footage on YouTube and some of the stills, and you guys look like you're just amazing live. Um, do you consider yourselves like a band that you have to see live to really appreciate? Is that kind of how you approach it? Um, good question. I think when we started with this band, you know, uh, the intention was being a great live band. You know, I always said, you know, it doesn't matter if we're playing a pop even you know if 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 we have to you know be on top of a table you know we still have to blow away people you know if there's 10 people you know they it doesn't matter we have to play a show like there's a hundred you know if there's 10 people in in in, in the pub they have to go to the jobs on monday and tell their colleagues wow you know i've been to this band you know and they blew the whole pub away you know that was the whole idea when we started this band and to this day we got that attitude you know when we go on the stage it's like full on you know and i hear a lot of people you know that see us live you know that afterwards that they saw us live to go like oh you know i i listened to it once you know on spotify or on youtube but then i saw it live you know and i bought the record so yeah i think that you know seeing us live you know adds a lot to to what we do no i i really respect that i know that her and i we uh had some cases a couple of times where we saw bands like Enslaved or Vader and it was like, you know, a weekday or something and there wasn't a lot of people there, but they played like they were playing in front of a thousand people like that. I love bands that appreciate and do that where they respect the audience enough to say, we're going to bring you everything we got, no matter how many people are there. That's that shows a passion for the music in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, but, that, but, that, but that's the reason that you're out there, you know, you know, by, by, you know, uh, you know, for the people, you know, that's what, what you do it for, you know, and, and everybody, you know, bought its, its ticket, you know, and they come to see your life. And, uh, you know, when you're lucky, it's a full house. And <laughs> and when you're not so lucky, you know, you maybe play to 10 people, but those 10 people have to be entertained, you know, and you have to go home like, wow, I saw a great band, you know. Right. Yeah. So in your mind, um, what would your dream tour or lineup consist of any particular festivals you want to play or what band you want to tour with? Wow. Another good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, only yeah. got a couple of, well, you know, ooh, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, it would be really cool, you know, um, you know, to do it, to do a really, you know, proper club tour, you know, we're doing the United States, something like that. that that's still one of, you know, the big, childhood dreams you know and i mean that we're going you know in, in october to the united states you know if you would have told that you know the 15 year old harold you know he would probably have gone insane you know? <laughs> so uh, so uh, well you know actually i don't know I, it's hard to answer that question actually i'm very grateful for every day you know that i'm healthy and you know, all my stuff is still functioning, you know, and I can pick up the guitar and write a song, you know, and and when I write a song, I feel a little bit like that 15 year old again. You know, I think that's the main motivation, you know, and all the other stuff that comes on top, you know, uh, regardless how great it is, you know, is that 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 extra, you know. So, of course, I, I dream big, you know, <laughs> I still do. Uh, but it's it's still, you know, when I pick up the guitar and, you know, have that riff again, I go like, oh, yeah, that's the thing that motivated me when I was 15. I can still relate to that 15 year old. You know, I think that's the, the main motivation. I hope, you know, I can cling on to that. That's the, the, the main reason, I guess, the main thing that drives me. I think well, I think you're doing a good job because I'm kind of the same way. You know, people used to tell me as a kid, teen that. 
I would outgrow this stuff. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's in my blood. It's never leaving. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not even music inclined like you are. So like you, obviously you're like, yeah, I still have a passion for this. But for me, it's like, I still want you to do this because I have a passion for the music. So yeah. I always, and when you say stuff like that, I have to think about my, uh, <laughs> my, my late father, you know, when I was young and it, you know, and then he, you know, was yelling at the door, you know, turn that, turn that thunder down. You know? <laughs> he was going like, boy, what kind of music are you listening to? And it's, it's, yeah. You know, grow up, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, my parents are very, very uh, conservative. So yeah, it was a shock. Yeah, I, mean, that's, that, I mean, that's, that's, it, it all can be explained. You know, if I look at the generation of my parents, you know, they grew up, up you know after the second world war you know it was a time of you know building the country again because everything was in ruins after the second world war and they had nothing yeah. you know they had nothing at all you know and all of a sudden they get this they get kids themselves you know which grew, grow up in a completely different age and time with different music and different influences and they couldn't understand you know we were going like our kids are insane <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's some crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was looking at Metal Archives and uh, for, is it Natasha, your basis? Is that how you pronounce yeah. your name? It, it looks like she has a nickname Pebbles. What's the story behind that? Well, that goes back, of course, to the Flintstones. Okay, uh, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, I mean, she's 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 not that tall. And I think her, one of... Um, her early bandmates uh, called her Pebbles, and that name, you know, just stuck. You know, sticked in, you know, and everybody's calling her Pebbles ever since, you know. So, That's funny. Yeah. Do you all dress her like that? Is that how you all call her on there? Yeah, actually, actually, she has been in my phone for over twenty years. You just with with Pebbles, you know, and, <laughs> and and it took me a while, and I figured out that she was actually called Natasha, you know. So uh, I'm trying to call her Natasha nowadays. So uh, yeah, to try to be more sure about, yeah, okay, I'm gonna call your real name now. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got another quick clip for music here. Um, this is actually my favorite track from the new record. Um, yeah, it's yeah. called "Lights Go Dim." All right. I don't know what it is about your guitar there, but you're doing something with the meh, meh. it almost reminds me of Zach Wilde in some ways. I just it's crazy. It's good. I love it. Yeah, that's the that's the, the famous pinch harmonic, you know. And uh uh of course Zach Wilde, you know. Actually, we played with him uh, last year with Black Label Society. Oh, wow. uh, I bet that was a great show because you guys oh, are kind yeah, of he's, 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 he's amazing. The whole, the whole band is amazing. But actually, that whole that sound, you know, that like, that thing that on the guitar, you know, that already, you know, uh, people like Randy Rhodes did it, you know, Eddie Van Halen did it, you know, and and, and I, that's such a cool thing. It's, it's the thing you can do with your guitar pick and your fingers. I mean, you hit it in the right way, you get that, you know, uh, Pantera did it, you know, Dimebag had that same kind of, but the fun part is with every guitarist, it sounds different. Yeah. There's nobody who does it exactly the same way. You know, it's your fingers your way of hitting it and it's 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 like uh it's like a signature thing you know like you go like oh you know that's that's oh that must be eddie van hale oh no that must be randy Rhodes. you know so it's your technique yeah yeah well basically i mean it's it's very old already um you know chuck berry uh did it you know they not did not play with that huge amount of gain that we do nowadays which you know makes it a really more singing sound you know but when you listen back to early rock and roll records uh, already on, on early CZ Top records, you already hear that pinch harmonic going on. Yeah. yeah. Well, that kind of leads me to my next question. Uh, for any young musicians up and coming, like who would want some advice from you on like how to capture your sound, like what kind of gear do you use and what kind of tunage are you using to create your sound? Um, well, you know, from a, from a technical point of view, I always you know, play, play two amps, you know, uh, so amp with, uh, with the, with
kind of amps, you know, the, really the tube amps, and, and they have this, you know, amazing dynamic sound, you know, when you hit hard, it jumps, you know, the sound, and when you stroke it softly, the sound moves back, it's, it's really a, a dynamic sound. And, you know, um, I experimented a lot with, you know, different strings and tunings and stuff. But I think the most important part is, you know, for musicians, um, do your own stuff, you know, try to figure out what you want to do and, and, and keep on searching and trying all kinds of, of stuff. I did the same thing, you know, I had all kinds of amps and tried this and tried that and, you know, went back to this or, <laughs> you know, changed stuff. And, and that's still going on. It's, it's with every new album, you know, I go like, ah, I'm going to do it completely different now. And most of the times I end up with all the stuff that I used before because it's a certain sound, you know, but it's, it's never done, you know, the, the, the quest for the right guitar sound and the right strings and the, that's that's always ongoing thing, you know, and, and that's that's the cool thing about it, you know. Right, yeah. yeah. So I mean I, I really my, my suggestion would be you know you know keep on searching for that you know and don't be satisfied and I really hope uh, that there are a lot of uh, young musicians nowadays that start playing their own original music again. Because, you know, I mean, I think the world is pretty saturated with far too many tribute bands nowadays. You know, when I look at the pubs and clubs, it's tribute this, tribute that, you know, and which is all fine. You know, by learning songs from other people, you you develop yourself, you know, right. that's obvious, you know. But uh, there's so much tribute bands going on. Like, I go like, where's the next Neil Young? You know, where's the next Kurt Cobain, you know? Where are they? <laughs> I'm sure right. you're <laughs> Yeah, I think we are kind of still waiting for that next big thing because it's been a while. <laughs> they, must, they must be there. They must be there somewhere in the garage. Come out, you know, show I, us your I'm song. I'm seeing a lot less uh, kids are interested in music and learning music and learning instruments than I feel like when we were younger. Um, we were, I mean, when I was younger, I, I didn't play guitar. I played in the band though i played trumpet but there was always like a music That's class right. yeah. in, in school so exactly. i don't even know why i picked the trumpet as the instrument but that was like you picked an instrument you learned it and i played for like five years yeah. i know he was saying like back in the 80s when in, in high school he played the guitar a little bit and he had friends who played music but i, I i'm just seeing i think out of my friends kids and you know the younger generation I think we only know one Travis who actually plays. And we know a lot of, you know, 18 and younger, like through our families and our friends' families. And it's it's kind of crazy that you're not seeing as much interest in music as there once was. Yeah, I also think that with, with, with the younger generations that music also has a different different role in their lives than maybe, you know, with the people of my age. I agree. You know? Back then, we, we didn't have much, you know. I, I bought records and I studied everything, you know. I studied the lyrics, you know. Even back when I didn't, you know, I didn't have any English class, you know. I read the lyrics and I tried to make my thing out of it, you know. But I read up on the sleeves where it was recorded, you know, and I didn't have a clue where that studio in San Francisco was, but I knew it was in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, all that stuff, you know, and there wasn't much else you know you had you couldn't you had to wait for magazines you know maybe when you're lucky they had this interview about your next favorite band but you there wasn't much you know so you had to play those music and we tape music for our friends and listen to records and we listen to records together and we also listen to albums which which you maybe uh didn't like at first listening you're going like mm. I'm not sure, but you played them again and again and again, yeah. and again. And all of a sudden, it started to make sense. You're like, oh, wow, this is even better than I thought. And I have the idea that nowadays when, when um, you know, everything in society is so fast, you know, when I speak to younger kids, you know, they listen 10 seconds of a song and they skip to the next and to the next. And they make me completely nervous. I go like, you know, why don't you listen to the entire song? And they go like, ah, no, it's boring. You know, go like, and uh, I think social media and Spotify has a lot to do with it. Uh, I even, uh, you know, notice it myself when I'm listening to a new record on Spotify. I'm, I'm 
easily attempted to, you know, to skip songs, you know, and listen through the album. And when I buy an album, I put it on, I listen to it, side E, side, side B, and turn it around, you know, maybe do something different in the house and listen to the music. And it all of a sudden it starts to make sense. And uh, I think the key word is patience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember having to break out the tape cassettes and you didn't have, I mean, you could skip, but it took more effort to do that than just to listen to it. you fast forward too far. And... <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it was better just to listen to the whole record. And yeah. you could really appreciate that, like even with the yeah. vinyl and everything. So. And on a bad day, the tape went like, woo, 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 woo. Oh, or, got, it, or got it, chewed it, up. And then you like, took it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what a nightmare that was. Um. So you mentioned that, you know, obviously you guys are still kind of like an up and coming band. You're kind of still small a little bit. Um, bands often talk about the, you know, the music industry and how it is right now with streaming and everything. Do you ever get disheartened by it all? Or do you just think that your passion for it's always going to be outweighing the negative part of the industry? You know, there, there always has been a negative part about uh, the industry. You know, um, when you look back in times and you read interviews with bands from, I don't you know, 20, 30 years ago, even 40 years ago, they always said like, you know, oh, we're getting double crossed by the record label or this manager took our money and all those stories. You know, it's it's of all times, you know. And I think nowadays, you know, um, yeah, it's maybe some stuff is it has gotten more difficult. On the other hand, recording has gotten easier if you have the right tools and if you know how to do it, but it, that had got has gotten easier. Getting your music out in the world has gotten way easier, you know? Like, like, like let's say 20, 25 years ago, this would have been almost impossible, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have known about each other, you know? Everybody was in his own little bubble. So, um, you know, I, I look at it the way the way it comes, you know, I can't change it. You know, the only thing I can do is make music, music with passion and hope, you know, that, that it comes through and that, you know, people like yourselves, you know, take notice of it and go like, oh, this could be interesting, you know, to to interview this guy from the Netherlands, you know, and let's see what he has to say. So um, I look at it in a rather positive way, you know, like I said earlier, I'm pretty happy to be around, you know, and play and I'm always contemplating the next move, you know, when the record is out, I'm already in my head with the next one, you know, that's it always has been, you know, regardless in which time frame I, I was with the music. Right. Yeah. And that's pretty much why we do all this because we're always trying to help out bands and get them noticed. It's cool. And it's so important. So important. Learn about the bands, find new music because, you know, sometimes great bands like yourself, I, I'm sure because at first you weren't even in the U S it's, you know, getting exposure over here. Yeah, that's 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 an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, I assume because you know, we know it from just being a host and everything that even for bands like you have day jobs. Is there anything you do in your downtime, like family or uh, writing music, or what do you do Hobbies. just to kind of? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the, 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 the decompress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's, it's difficult because, you know, uh, you know, next to the day jobs, you know, getting everything organized in the way that we do, you know, like, let's say, you know, like in, in the fall, you know, we will be, be touring, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that that's quite a strain, you know, on, on families. You have to organize it with day jobs and stuff like that. So next to uh, our day jobs and families, there is the band and there's not that much more, you know, you have to be a, a little bit crazy to do this, you know, yeah. because, you know, um, vacations, everything is always planned and done with the schedule of the band in mind. Okay. When are we going to record an album? When are we going to do a tour? Oh, I have to fit my vacation in between. And my wife goes, Oh, don't forget about the birthday of that. This <laughs> oh, 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 shit, you know, so, yeah. Sometimes it's 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 madness and it takes quite a strain, you know, on the people, you know, that we're together with, you know, uh, wives, friends, families, etc. Uh, but they they understand our madness. <laughs> we're, we're lucky with that. And in between, you know, when I have some downtime, you know, I really like to be outside, you know, have have a have a walk, you know, enjoy nature. 
Uh, I really like that. I'm way, way into animals in the countryside. I grew up on the countryside. And, you know, that's really, especially over the years, you know, being busy. I know it is it's so important, you know, to, you know, get down from everything, you know, and, and you know, notice that you're human after all, you know, and don't, don't get too excited and too carried away with all the stuff that you do. So what are your plans now for the band uh, for the rest of the year? You'd mentioned that you were going to be touring again in the later yeah. part of the year. Yeah, well, for, for the rest of the year, we will be very busy doing shows. You know, there's still shows coming in. We're still booking summer festivals. Like I said, October till oh. December is completely, completely booked. You know, there's not, not, a, not a tiny hole left, you know. So it's going to be really, uh, it's going to be great. But it's also going to be you know, finding our way with all our, private stuff as well how we do things and probably going to take uh, the holidays off you know uh, end of december and we're planning uh to enter the studio somewhere late january you know and working on the next record which awesome. will take another couple of weeks months you know before everything is done hopefully have a record out uh maybe you know somewhere end of end of 24 when we're lucky oh wow cool yeah cool Maybe so, uh, any last words for your fans or anything like that? Where can they find your stuff? Yeah, well, they, yeah, uh, they can find it on on the internet, of course. There's a lot, <laughs> a lot on, on 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 our YouTube. I like I like that broad question. <laughs> Just smile, well, on the internet. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, we're on the social media, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty active on, on, on Facebook, you know, and on, on uh, and Instagram. We really like it to talk to to our fans, you know, if they send us a message, we always, you know, try to reply it in time. And I think that's the beauty of, of you know, these days, you know, we get such, such, such great, you know, messages from all over the world, you know, that's, that's really the cool thing about it, you know, and makes you aware, you know, that there's so many people you know, into music and that music, you know, is such an, a, you know, international language, you know, to, to get along. What we said earlier, you know, all of a sudden it doesn't matter that much, you know, what's your opinion on all kind of, you know, worldly situations, you know, but that music thing, you know, brings brings a lot together. So, uh, yeah, you can check us out on the, on the Facebook, on the internet, on the website, everything, and uh, uh, drop us a line, I would say. Um, I, I saw your Facebook page. I did not know that you had an Instagram page, so I will make sure I, or do you have a Twitter as well? No, we're not, not we're not into the Twitter thing. No, <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I, myself, I really like Instagram. Um, it's just enough that you have like a social connection, but it's lots of pictures, which is what I True. mostly look at when I'm on social media. Um, yeah. We will make sure that when we put this up, it's going to go on our YouTube, but we're going to share it on Facebook, Twitter, yeah, cool, and cool. Instagram and make sure we tag yeah, you. Yeah, I have all your links and everything as well. Yeah. yeah, cool, cool, really cool. All right, well, hold on, Harold. We're going to close this out. And uh, for the people watching, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, please, and please go check out Degeth. The They're fucking awesome. Uh, you'll really enjoy their music, and uh, we're going to get our outro going, and then Harold, just hang on a minute, and uh, thank you very much again, sir, for taking the time out for us. Cool. Just for your time.